yard meeting, uh, an after school meeting with some parents that she really wanted to go to, that she really needed to be there for. So when she got the call, she immediately started trying to call the defendant. And she called from the landline at school, and she called, and she called, and she couldn't get him. Then she called him from her cell phone over and over and over again, and she couldn't get him. And folks, she was miffed. Can I object to what anything that she might have been? I said, that's not evidence. Because state of mind, Your Honor. All right, rephrase. Okay. You will see people and hear from people who will tell you that they observed that Belinda was angry and upset and frustrated because she couldn't find him. Yet again, she didn't know where he was, she couldn't reach him, and she was going to have to deal with this problem on her own. So she left school, she went to the daycare, she picked up Evan, and she took him home. Now, in the course of that, she eventually did reach the defendant, and he came home and spelled her, and she went back to school at around one o'clock. She did, so she went back to the school, she finished out the afternoon, she went to her ARD meeting as planned, and she left the school around 3.20 to 3.30. From there, she went for the short distance from Katie High School to her in-law's house, his parents' house. The reason she did that was because she was picking up some homemade soup. She swung by, she made a quick trip picking up the soup. She was in a hurry. She didn't have Evan. She had a sick kid at home. And she had, that Monday evening, an important standing date. It was bunko night with her girlfriends. There were a dozen women, coaches, wives, and teachers who got together one night a month for bunko. And Monday night was her bunko night. So she was in a hurry to get home and get the soup and, and, and get everything done so she could get to bunko. She didn't even get out of her car when she went to her in-law's house. She got the soup and she headed home. She arrived home between 3.45 and 4, a little after 4, in that neighborhood. Now this is as good of a time as any to tell you that you are gonna hear a lot of talk about times, about the times things happened and how long it takes to do things and approximately when people saw things. And I want to point out to you that the vast majority of those things will be approximations. They will be estimates. And we all know that human beings are not real good at estimating time. And don't forget that this occurred, what we're talking about, occurred long before the day when we're all wearing smartwatches and our phones are perfectly synced to our watches and all of our clocks are perfectly synced like they are today. Now there will be some times that are anchored, that are set in stone, and we actually refer to them as anchored times. But there are those, and when they are anchored, you'll know it. But the vast majority of the times are estimations by human beings. Now, as I said, she gets home between 3.45 and a little after 4. The next thing anyone sees or hears from the Temple House occurs between around 5.35 to 5.40 when the defendant goes across the street to his across the street neighbor Mike's house, Mike Ruggiero, and he starts banging on Mike Ruggiero's door, banging loudly, said that had it been a glass door, he'd have broken the door. He was banging so loudly and yelling. To Mike, hey Mike, Mike, this is David. Mike opens the door, he hands him Evan, and he tells him, call 911, my house is been broken into. And then he turns around and runs back across the street to his house. Mike hands Evan to his wife Peggy, he says Peggy call 911, and he goes to follow the defendant to help, to find out what's going on. And by the time he gets there, the defendant's already gone in the back gate of his, into his backyard, into his house, and shut the door. But Mike still wants to follow him, but Mike is stopped. When Mike gets there, he sees through the fence the back door to the temple home. It had what appeared to be nine little small panes of glass above the door handle, and one of which, right by the lock, was broken. 
And Mike saw that through the fence. However, he couldn't get any further than the fence for one reason, because of Shaka. You're going to hear a lot about Shaka. Shaka was the Temple family dog. He was a full-grown black chow dog, and he was the biggest, baddest, fiercest watchdog in all the neighborhood. He was known far and wide within that neighborhood of being ferocious and not to be messed with and not to be trusted. Shaka was there in the backyard behind the fence snarling, growling, barking, trying to get at Mike. He was flinging his body up against the fence to try to get through the fence at Mike, which was not something uncommon for him to do. So needless to say, Mike wasn't getting in. He'd lived across the street in that house for quite some time, and Mike was not going to mess with that dog, so he stood at the gate. Shortly thereafter, in response to Peggy's 911 call, officers from the constable's office, Precinct 5, showed up as well. They pulled right in, and they were confronted with the same problem that Mike was confronted with. Shaka. They couldn't get in. So they stood at the gate, and they were a little perplexed because they'd been called for a burglary. They didn't know what they had, but they knew they needed to get in there, and Shaka was blocking them. You're going to hear from those officers, or you're going to hear that these officers are trained to deal with vicious dogs. They're used to dealing with dogs, and that Shaka was the baddest of them all. It was so bad, you're going to hear how close those officers came to having to do something that no officer ever wants to do, shooting. They drew their weapons, and they were just about to shoot Shaka so they could get in the house when the defendant walked out. He walked out, he calmly, matter-of-factly said to the officers, my wife is dead, she's been shot. Now, interestingly enough, the investigators, the trained investigators who worked the scene will tell you that when they went in that house, it was not readily apparent to them that Belinda had been shot. But he said, my wife is dead, she's been shot. Once he was outside, officers had him put Shaka in the garage so that they could get in, because they still couldn't get in until Shaka was neutralized. And when they got in, they found a horrible scene, a horrible scene. Belinda was lying dead in her master bedroom closet, on her stomach, on top of baby Aaron, with a massive wound to the back of her head still wearing her shoes, still wearing her eyeglasses, still wearing her clothes from school, still wearing all her jewelry. She died from a contact gunshot, shotgun blast to the back of her head from what was later determined to be a 12-gauge shotgun loaded with double off buckshot, a home defense type ammo. And from that, a massive investigation ensued. And from the very beginning, Things didn't add up. In particular, the idea that this was some sort of a burglary gone bad didn't make any sense. This is one of those situations, like the picture that Mr. Turner showed you at Fort Iron, that at first blush, maybe it does look like a burglary, but upon a second look, it didn't make sense. First, this neighborhood. It's the Creekstone subdivision. Mm -hmm. This neighborhood was the classic suburbia. I mean, it was as suburban as you can even imagine. They lived on a corner lot in the middle of this neighborhood, and it was a nice neighborhood. Low crime, people felt safe, lots of families with kids that lived in the neighborhood. And in the middle of the afternoon on a Monday on a school day, that Creekstone neighborhood was a hive of activity. Kids were coming home from school. The school buses were dropping kids off right next to the Temple House. So kids were coming home, they were running around on the streets going home. A 
couple of people were coming home from work. They were getting their mail. The mailboxes to the neighborhood, just a big community mailbox like a lot of suburban neighborhoods have, was right across the street from the Temple House where people were either walking to the mailboxes, pulling their cars up to the mailboxes, right there after work. Kids were outside playing. It was a nice day that day for a January day. People were going for their walks. People were walking their dogs. There, there was, it was, as I said, a hive of activity. It didn't make a lick of sense that a burglar would break into that house at that time of day, right there on the corner of a lot in the middle on a Monday afternoon. It also didn't make sense. A shotgun? A 12-gauge shotgun? What burglar schleps a 12-gauge shotgun to a burglary? Burglars aren't, they won't stop. The, uh, y y y how are you gonna hide a 12-gauge shotgun? How, I mean, how? And uh, you'll hear from investigators who have investigated countless burglaries. You don't take weapons to, the, to burglaries, and certainly not 12-gauges. And this was a time this afternoon was a time after Belinda was typically home. So anybody that ever saw that neighborhood would have known that she's already home. And we've, I've already mentioned this, shotgun. You all know, everyone knows, it doesn't take rocket science to know this. What's the best deterrent for a burglar? Now, that's before the days, because again, back in the day, that's before the days when we all had ring cameras and nest cameras on our front doors. Back in the day, what was the best deterrent to a burglar? A barky dog. It could be a barky dog this big, or it could be a big, scary barky dog. But that's the best deterrent to a burglar. So, how in the world can anybody get past shotgun? How in the world, or why in the world would anybody want to get past Shaco. And this, this point of entry, as we call it, the broken window on the back door, where presumably a burglar would have made that the point of entry, that was behind the fence. That was in Shaka's backyard. Shaka, you'll hear, was an indoor-outdoor dog. Sometimes he was out in the yard. Sometimes he was inside the house. He was kept inside the house oftentimes to keep from having any kind of a ruckus. And on that day, and sometimes they left the garage door open. Their house had a standalone garage. Some days they left the garage door open so Shaka could get in and out, kind of use it like a doggy door. But Shaka was an indoor outdoor dog. Now tellingly, that afternoon, nobody heard a peep out of Shaka. Not a bark, not a growl, not a nothing. Nobody saw Shaka, nobody heard Shaka. Whereas if this was a burglary, they sure should have. And if this was a burglary, where should Shaka have been? Dead, that's where. The burglar let Shaka live, but not Belinda? That didn't make any sense. Then there were other things there at that scene that did not make sense because it gave the appearances of manipulation. Manipulation in order to deter. Let me tell you what I mean by, I mean by that. First, the biggest manipulation that jumped out at investigators was that back door, that point of entry, as we'll call it. So the back door, as I told you, look, was one sheet of glass actually up in the top that had dividers so it looked like nine little panes. It was one pane. And the one closest to the, on the far, as you're looking, on the far, bottom right-hand side was broken out. Just that one little pane was, okay? That door opened to the left inside into the house, okay? So if a burglar broke that door in order to reach in and unlock the door, where would the glass have gone? You don't need a physics degree to know this. The glass would have gone directly in front. That makes sense. When investigators went in, and, and you'll see these pictures. You'll see lots of them. You'll see the video. 
When investigators went in, they were struck by the fact that there was no demonstrable glass in front. There was a tiny bit down here, directly below the door, but not out front. You know where the glass was? The glass was all over here to the left in the living room, way over to the left. And they opine, and you'll see, and you'll, you'll be able to look at it yourselves to tell the only way that glass could have gotten where all that glass was was if the door was open when the glass was broken. I think we can all agree. If the door was open when the glass was broken, this ain't no burglary, right? A couple of other things about the house that jumped out at them. Burglary, you typically break into steel stock. Well, if you're going to steal stuff in the middle of the afternoon, on a corner lot, on a Monday, you'd want to steal stuff that was inconspicuous, right? Y'all remember back, back in the day, 20 years ago, what our televisions were like then? You know, today we have those nice flat screens that you can just almost carry around like this. That wasn't then. They were deep, you know, they were huge, they were heavy, and when investigators went in, they found a big, upwards of 50 pound television that was probably this deep, laying on his side in that living room by all the broken glass, still plugged in. Now, how in the world is somebody gonna get that out of that house without it being noticed with a shotgun? That didn't make any sense. And the investigators found little bureau drawers in a, ca in a hutch in the dining room open. Not disturb, nothing undisturbed, nothing ransacked, just pulled up. That's not what a burglar does. Burglar does. Now, they didn't see or find anything in the investigation to suggest that anything had been stolen at all. Now that changed slightly 16 days later when the Temple family, or excuse me, when investigators read in the Houston Chronicle that now the Temple family was saying that a bunch of the women's jewelry had been stolen. And they ultimately got a list from the insurance company of items that now they were saying were stolen. Things like costume jewelry, pairs of earrings, things like that. Now, did that make any sense? Belinda's jewelry box was there on her dresser, closed, appearing to be totally undisturbed, what burglar goes through and picks out pairs of earrings? That doesn't make sense. More tellingly, in that same room, there was a tray that was out in the open, in plain view, that had this defendant's big old wedding ring, a big thick gold necklace, gold chain, his watch, and his huge conference championship ring all very valuable, all undisturbed, out there in plain view. That didn't make sense. And another thing that was undisturbed was Belinda's purse. Investigators found it hidden away in a hallway closet under the stairs. Now, what woman puts her purse under the stairs when she comes home from work? Not Belinda Temple. She had a habit. That she came home, she put her keys and her purse either on the dining room table or on the kitchen counter. Probably like most of us do. Not in a part, not in a closet. Yet that's where investigators found it. Why would a burglar need to hide her purse? There are other things, and I'll save those. Other things about the house that didn't make sense, that didn't ring true. But we'll talk about those later, and you'll find them. Now, as I mentioned, huge investigation began. Lots of detectives, lots of officers. And one of the things the detectives obviously wanted to do that night was to take a statement from the defendant. He was the husband. He was potentially the last person to see her alive. And so they endeavored to do that. They took him down to the Clay Road substation in Katy, not to downtown to the big sheriff's office where they take suspects. They took him to the Clay Road substation. They took a non-custodial interview from him. By that I mean 
He wasn't under arrest. And he went home afterwards with his parents. So he took a statement, and you'll see the statement, and you'll hear about the statement. And in the statement, he told investigators about Evan being sick that morning, about how Belinda had called him to pick Evan up, and he came home and traded off with her, didn't hardly even speak to her before she left and went back to work. And then he spent the afternoon there in the house with Evan. You'll see that he told detectives that Belinda called him about 3.30 to tell him that she was on her way home and that she arrived home around 3.45. He said that then that she went upstairs to rest and that he took Evan to a park in the subdivision, then to a grocery store, and then to the Home Depot. He says then that he got home around 5.45, pulled into the garage, immediately saw the broken glass on the door, and raced across the street to Mike's house, as I told you already. That then he went back inside, he ran inside the house, and he found Belinda in the closet dead. And that he then called 911 from the closet, which he did. And don't worry, you'll, you'll hear the 911 call. We'll bring it to you. And when you hear it, listen closely. Listen closely to what's said, what's not said, what's done, what's not done, and what you hear and what you don't hear. And with that statement, he almost gave himself the perfect alibi. Almost. Let me show you on a map of Katy from back in 99. <coughs> Katy was not the concrete jungle, jungle that it is today. And you'll see lots of diagrams up on the screen and things, but just for purposes of, of, the, of today. You'll hear that he said he went to a Brookshire Brook 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 That he, after he left the house, he went to a Brookshire Brothers up on Franz Road. And then, then he went to the Home Depot. And then he went back home after having stopped at a park. And investigators did precisely what you would expect them and want them to do, which is they went to the grocery stores. And they found the surveillance video that had him on it, that he was in this Brookshire Brothers between 4.32 and 4.38 that afternoon. Their home was all the way down here. He didn't go to a store in the neighborhood or a convenience store. He went into a grocery store way up here near where his parents lived and where he grew up. So between 432 and 438, he's inside the store. We agree with that. It's on the video. That is anchored, like we talked about. Then he mentioned that he went to the Home Depot. He says he went straight to the Home Depot from the Brookshire Brothers over here. He's seen on that video just a quick blip at 5.14 p.m. And like I said, investigators got that video, and you'll see it. 5.14 p.m. is also an anchor time. And with those videos, he almost got it right. But see, there was a big problem, one problem that jumps out. These two stores, the Berkshire Brothers and the Home Depot, are at most 12 to 15 minutes apart. We'll be generous and say 20 minutes apart. Okay? At most, it takes you 12 to 15 minutes to drive between the two stores, 20 to be really, really conservative. Well, he's seen on this video, out of, he's gone by 4.38. He doesn't get to this video till 514. That's 36 minutes. 36 minutes between those two. What was he doing in between those two? What was he doing there? <clears throat> See, that's the problem with trying to create the perfect alibi. First, you better hope that people see you in the places you say you are. And that brings up a good point, or a good moment to tell you. Investigators canvassed all of the parks repeatedly, trying to find somebody, any 
anybody who saw him or Evan or his truck at that park that afternoon. Nobody did. Now look, I get that just because nobody saw you doesn't mean it didn't happen. I get that. But way more important than that is the converse of that. You better hope nobody sees you in a place or at a time that is inconsistent with your alibi. You better hope because that's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. There's just no accounting for chance sightings. There's just no accounting for chance sightings. In this case, we almost got it right. Almost. But the evidence is going to show you one or two pretty major missteps that blows that alibi right out of the water. I'm not going to take much time to tell you about them right now. You'll see them. You'll find them. And when you do, they're going to hit you upside the head. Because when you see them, it will be clear that he almost got it right, but he didn't. Now, I'm certain that Mr. Schneider's going to tell you when he comes up here that he just didn't have enough time to do all the things that he would have had to have done to be guilty of this crime. Two things where that is concerned. A, remember we're talking about estimates. And B, when you hear everything, you'll see that there was ample time. And additionally, I just simply point out to you, if you're going to create an alibi for yourself, wouldn't you want to give yourself as little time to do all the things you need to do as you can? There was plenty of time. Now, let me tell you briefly about the investigation. Sorry. Counsel for the defense has already told you at Board Iyer that he was not arrested until 2005, and he's right. They kept investigating. They kept looking at different rabbit trails and different avenues and different things like that. They talked to you about tunnel vision. A little hard to complain about tunnel vision when you wait six years to arrest somebody. They followed up on rabbit trail after rabbit trail. They issued rewards. They blanketed Katy, Texas with reward posters and billboards and all kinds of things to try to find additional information that there was a burglar out there and they never got any. Additionally, over that investigation, officers did everything they could to try and develop forensic evidence. Granted, it's 1999, but they did. They fingerprinted the entire house ex exhaustively and all of the fingerprints they got were either Melinda's or defendants. They did DNA testing all the way up until the last several years. They continued to do DNA they never got anything other than Belinda or the defendant that didn't tell them anything. They brought in the FBI to do additional forensic testing. The FBI. And they didn't get anything to tell them anything. And they looked for the weapon. And I'll just tell you right now, the murder weapon has never been found to this day in spite of extensive searches. Now, I will tell you that in conjunction with what I told you a little while ago, the defendant was a hunter. He had hunted with a 12-gauge shotgun throughout his life. And in spite of the fact that his home had bird hunting and duck hunting and goose hunting paraphernalia all over it and equipment for it, there was no shotgun in that house. There was no shotgun found in that house and no shotgun found since. Now let me tell you a couple of things that I think are important because you know, when Turner talk, Mr. Turner talked to you well, two weeks ago now, he told you, look, we're going to bring you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we are. So I want to touch on a couple of things that I think are important to tell you about. Okay? First thing is the Roberts boys. You're going to hear a lot of talk probably about the Roberts boys. The Roberts family lived immediately behind the Temple family. Their back fences butted up to each other with the garage in between the two houses. The Roberts had three sons, nine, eight, and six. And the three sons told investigators of variations of that while they were watching a movie that afternoon, they heard a loud noise that they characterized as a boom, a firecracker, or a gunshot. 
And it was estimated, based on the movie and other things, that it was sometime around 4.30 or after. Admittedly, the defendant was at the Home Depot, excuse me, at the Brookshire Brothers from 4.30 to 1. So you're going to hear a lot about that. We're going to bring it to you. We're going to bring you the Roberts Boys. And we're going to bring you everyone else who heard all kinds of different bangs and booms and noises and all kinds of things in that neighborhood. And ultimately, when you hear all that, you're going to conclude, who knows what they heard? Who knows where it came from? Who knows what happened? The other thing that I need to tell you about that I think Mr. Schneider's probably going to talk to you about a lot, and that is this. There has been a 20-year-long campaign to pin Belinda's murder on the boy next door. Let me tell you about the boy next door. The Temple's next door neighbors were the Sanders family. Riley Joe Sanders Jr., his wife Connie, their oldest daughter Tara, and Tara was already out of the house when all these events happened in 1999, and their youngest child was a son, Riley Joe Sanders III, Joey. He was 16 years old when all this happened. He was a student at Katy High School, and bless his heart, Joey was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. No sense sugarcoating. He was in Belinda's content mastery program, the program at school to help kids, to tutor them, as part of the special education department. And Joey, like all the other kids at Kilgore High, Kil Katie High School, thought very highly of Belinda, and she tutored him with his math. But during the 1998 and 1999 school year, Joey had two things that he really liked to do. And those two things did not help him one bit where his academic progress was concerned, and when his next door neighbor got murdered. Those two things, Joey liked to skip school and Joey liked to smoke pot. And he did both of those things a lot. <clears throat> and it just so happens he did both the afternoon that Belinda was murdered. He skipped the seventh period that day, the last period of school, he blew off the last period and he left with his best friend, Cody Ellis. And the two of them went to Joey's house, got some pot, then drove around in Joey's truck, smoked the joint, noticed that school was letting out. After they finished the joint, he went, he dropped Cody off at home, at his house around 3.30 or so, and then he went back home. Joey did, to his house next door. <coughs> Once he got home, he wanted some more pot, because like I said, he's good at it. And so he called a couple more of his buddies, Cody Towner, a different Cody, and Michael Grantham, asked him if they wanted to come over after school, and they said sure, so they did. Then they went to another buddy's house, Randy Hess, who lived a few blocks away, see if he had any pot he could share with them, and he didn't. And they didn't have any money to buy any, so they left. And they were leaving Cody's, or excuse me, they were leaving Randy's house, and uh, they were getting in Michael's car. They were all in Michael's car, white car. And they were in Michael's car, and Cody called shotgun. Or, excuse me, Joey called shotgun. And as is typical with teenage kids, when one person calls shotgun, what's that mean for the other person? You gotta hurry up and run, jump, and front seat. So that's what Cody did. So Joey and Cody and Michael kind of joked around and bickered around, and so they ended up driving back over to uh, Joey's house and Joey walked beside the car because you know, he'd taken his shotgun seat. So they go, then they get back in the car together, they buy some cigarettes because there was a clerk at a close by store that let him have them. They went back to the house. Michael looked at his watch or, or realized that it was 4.45 and he needed to go pick his mom up from work. So the two boys left. They picked up Michael's mom on time just like they did every day, normal day, and they left, and, and that was that. Joey, being the little pothead that he was, 
did exactly what you'd expect him to do, which is he ate some food, and then he laid on the couch and took a nap. And when his dad got home at 6, his dad found him asleep on the couch. Okay. So dad says, you know, holy cow, what's going on next door? By this time, police are starting to show up next door. All kinds of stuff's going on. So Joey and his dad did pretty much what everybody in that neighborhood did, which is they went outside to see what was going on. And they stood around outside, and they watched all the going, comings and goings, just like pretty much everybody in that neighborhood did. And then the news cameras start arriving. And of course, Channel 2, Channel 13, Channel 11, all of them start showing up. What 16-year-old kid doesn't want to be on TV, right? So Joey ends up getting interviewed by Channel 2 News. Channel, he tells Channel 2 that Mrs. Temple was a good teacher, that everybody liked her at school, he liked her a lot, she was a nice lady, and that he'd been to school all day. That's what he told Channel 2. Well, of course, it didn't take long for somebody to call investigators, say, hey, 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 that kid Sanders, he skipped the seventh period that day. And let's face it, standing alone by himself, that sounds kind of suspicious, doesn't it? Of course, told you he was good at it. It sounds significantly less suspicious when you consider that that school year from 98 to 99, Joey skipped 230 odd classes. 230 odd classes. So, him skipping the seventh period that day was pretty much what he always did. Nevertheless, investigators did exactly what you'd think they would do, which is they talked to him once they found this out. They talked to lots of people in the neighborhood. They canvassed that neighborhood repeatedly. And so they canvassed the Sanders family as part of the neighborhood. But then once they got this information, they talked to Joey and his family and his friends <coughs> repeatedly. And not surprisingly, when you're dealing with 16-year-old potheads who don't wear watches, they did, weren't tremendously consistent on their times. But they talked to him over and over again, and the boys all told basically the story that I just told you. But investigators didn't rely just on what Joey and his friends told them. They went, and with Mr. Sanders' consent, they searched his house. With Mr. Sanders' consent, Mr. Sanders gave them every shotgun shell he had in his house, willingly. Now, investigators got a little bit excited, briefly, because when Mr. Sanders gave them a whole load of shotgun shells, there were some of them that on the shell on the outside said double lock button. They got a little excited, but they were reloaded shells, and I, we'll talk more about what reloaded shells are basically later, but basically they're reused shells. And when they opened them up, they didn't have double lock buck in them, they had birdshot. Just little BBs like birdshot. So they weren't anything like what was used to kill the women. But they turned those up. Now, I'm sure that you will also hear about what will commonly be known as the Hetherington burglary. The Hetherington burglary, let me tell you about that. There was another kid at Katie High School named Casey Gooseby. And, and I know there's a lot of names I'm bandying about here, I promise you, it'll, it'll make sense. Casey's mom was dating a lawyer named Riley Hetherington. And long about New Year's, Casey decided that Mr. Hetherington wasn't treating his mom very well. And he didn't like the way he was treating him, so he decided he'd get back at him. And so on the, over the New Year's holiday, in the middle of the night, he and a couple of his buddies broke into Mr. Hetherington's house. They chunked a, a rock through the window and crawled in through the window. And they stole a, shot, a couple of shotguns and a, and a box of jewelry. And one of those kids was Cody Ellis, the kid Joey Sanders was with earlier in the afternoon, but everyone can agree was home that afternoon. But one thing that everyone will agree with is that Joey Sanders and his two buddies he was with later in the afternoon, Cody Towner and Michael Grantham, had absolutely nothing to do with the heaven timber. So those boys, they went and did that, and it was, in, it was investigated, and 
those kids took the two shotguns and the jewelry box, and a few days later, one of the boys, some of the boys decided they wanted to go shoot the shotguns that had been taken. And Cody Ellis was one of them that was with them, so he asked Joey to go along. And Joey said, sure. And he grabbed a shotgun from his dad's collection of guns. And this is a good time to mention, too. I think you'll already know this. Katy, Texas is the waterfowl hunting capital of the world. I mean, there's geese painted on the water tower, for crying out loud. There's sculptures of geese and ducks and all that kinds of things all over going into town. I mean, there are a ton of shotguns in Katy, Texas. Frankly, I would suggest to you that it is more unusual to not have a shotgun for a man in Katy, Texas than to not have one, or than to have one. Then Joey's dad had several. He ski shot, he hunted, all those things. So he grabs one of his dad's 12 gauges, and he goes with this, the, the other boys, and they shoot out some trees and just stupid kid stuff. And of course, Joey didn't get permission from his dad. And of course, Joey gets ready to take the gun back home, and his dad almost catches him. So rather than get caught, and this is all before January 11th, rather than get caught, he hands the gun to Cody. Cody holds on to it with the idea he'll get it back and then put it up later when his dad won't ground him or whatever. Well, it didn't take investigators but about a millisecond on the Hetherington burglary to figure out that it was the soon-to-be disgruntled stepson of the lawyer who did it. And sure enough, they all fessed up. Sure enough, they gave the shotguns back, gave one of the shotguns back, and they later recovered the other one. And they submitted both of those shotguns to the lab, and they got absolutely nothing from them. They were clean. And, of course, when that happened, and then Belinda was murdered, our investigators in Belinda's case, of course, the Hetherington burglary got on their radar screen, as I'm sure it should. Now, I think Mr. Snyder's going to tell you that it was some kind of a look at <coughs> me. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was a burglary. Burglary's a burglary. That's it. And it was just a bunch of stupid kids. So when investigators from Belinda's case started coming around, Cody turned in Joey's shotgun that he had used to shoot earlier, uh, back in early January. And it was subjected to tons of, of forensic analysis. And I will tell you that there's not a lot ballistically you can do with shotguns. That's just the way it is. Not like handguns, not like rifles, things like that. But one thing they did do is they looked for microscopic glass fragments. The idea being that if a burglar broke out that window, it ought to have microscopic glass fragments. No guns they ever found did. More importantly, they looked inside the barrel of every gun that they looked at because with the wound that Belinda suffered, the barrel of that gun should have had tons of her blood inside of it. And none of them did. None of them did. Now, I know probably some of y'all are hunters and somebody's sitting there thinking, wait, 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 what if they clean the gun? Well, in Joey's gun case, there was actually a shell inside of it, a spent shell. So does that make a lick of sense that somebody would clean the gun but leave the shell in? That doesn't make any sense. It's clean, just like every other gun that was used in this, that was looked at in this particular case. Now, I'm not going to try to predict every single thing that may come up in this trial. I will tell you when it does, we will deal with it. And the last thing I want to mention to you, is something that Mr. Turner brought up to you at Board Hour last time. He said to you that in a murder case, it is important for you to see the evidence before the murder, the evidence at the time of the murder, and the evidence after the murder. I've talked to you already about the before, the marriage, the issues in the marriage. I've talked to you about the during, the January 11th and right around there. I want to talk to you for just a minute about the after. Mr. Turner talked to you about consciousness of guilt, about the idea of, is someone acting as an innocent person after the fact? And in this case, what you're going to hear from the evidence is that this defendant threatened his friends who were cooperating with the police told him unequivocally to keep their mouths shut. 
He tried to cajole grand jury testimony out of them, even though that's unlawful. He stalked them and followed them around. And wouldn't an innocent person want to know who was responsible for the murder of his wife and child? Wouldn't any innocent person want to know that? In this case, when asked directly, don't you want to know who killed Belinda? Defendant's response, what's it matter? Wouldn't bring it back anyway. Well, folks, it matters to us. It matters to her family. This is a circumstantial evidence case. Not going to shock in that. This case is a puzzle with a whole lot of pieces. And I think you've already, you've already seen that. We're going to put those pieces together for you. But it's going to take some time. Be patient with us. Pay close attention. Let's put it together, together. Because when we do, what you're going to see is that Joey Sanders or anybody else, yeah, there are some puzzle pieces that go together, but they don't belong in the same puzzle. They don't belong in the puzzle that is Belinda's murder. When we put all the pieces together, it's going to be real clear to you. There is only one person on this earth who could have done this. And when we're all done, when it's over, we're going to come back here and we're going to ask you to find this defendant guilty of the murder of Belinda. It's going to be the only answer. I look forward to presenting our evidence to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tanner. How's everybody doing over there? Do I need a break? You do? Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a 10 minute break. We have a jury. <laughs> All rise for the jury.